Hello, and welcome to Code Rage. My name is Robert Love. Today's session is titled Introduction to Encryption, Understanding Security Algorithm Use Cases. The basic goal of this session is to let you understand what different types of algorithms there are and how to understand which one you'd use and when. Um, but I want to start off with a small disclaimer. I don't pretend to be a security expert. I work with these types of experts every day. I am a developer who is highly interested in security. And I've seen misapplications of security technologies leading to a false sense of security. My goal with this session is to help know what algorithm to pick and when, giving you direction on ways to implement these algorithms in a secure way. Uh, in this session, we'll start with a little introduction to cryptography. Then we'll cover hashes. Then we'll deal with symmetric key. And then we'll deal with public key, or another word for this is asymmetric uh, uh, key uh, encryption or, or cryptography. Uh, the desire to keep uh, data or a message secret has existed for a very long time. Often these methods keep our data secure have been figured out, as you might see, like the Enigma machine here. And more sophisticated methods have to be developed. As a child, I remember playing with the secret decoder ring. It was not longer long after I'd been playing with it that I wondered, could I figure out how this coded message works and figure out what somebody else might have wrote? Um, well, the Caesar cipher is what the seeker secret decoder ring uses, and it was developed in ancient Rome. It takes a given alphabet and rotates all the characters by X number of digits. And in this case, we've rotated it four digits. Well, as a kid, I learned how to break these codes really quickly. And I would look for common letters in the English alphabet with common words. The puzzle books that I used as a kid to play with these became more and more difficult by randomizing the letters instead of just rotating them. But ultimately, this type of cipher can easily be broken. A computer program could easily figure out text using this cipher in less than a second. Given that, you should never use a Caesar cipher in code. It's just not secure. But the reason I bring it up is to introduce a few uh, concepts. Each cipher has an algorithm behind it. This algorithm is used for both encryption and decryption. Each algorithm typically has a key. The term uh, plain text is used to describe the input data. The, the cipher text is used to describe the encrypted data. Each algorithm should be reviewed to identify its weaknesses. This information is critical at deciding how or if you should implement a given algorithm. Now out of the past and into some modern day cryptography. Hashing is used as a base primitive in many security operations. A cryptographic hash has the following properties. It's easy to compute. The hash value, a given hash value for any message. And when we look at the slide, that I have that shows the examples for how to code this, you'll quickly go, yeah, I see that it's pretty easy. It's infeasible to generate a message from its hash. So in other words, it's not reversible. You can't just take a given hash and get back the message. Although there are hacks with dictionary-based hacks that uh, do allow us to determine if a value is hashed, but we can't uh, from a given value what the hash will be, and then we can compare hashes. Uh, that's a dictionary attack. It's not feasible to say from a given hash with no dictionary to figure out what um, the original message was. It's infeasible to modify a message without changing its hash. So if I have a message that's 123 and the next message I have 1234, they will have different hashes. It's also infeasible to find two different messages with the same hash. So a message of ABC and another message of DEF would never produce the same hash value. Um, well, in RAD Studio, uh, we have um, currently supports three security related hashing algorithms, MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. Although weaknesses have been found in MD5 and SHA-1, so the current recommendation for uh, hash for security purposes is SHA-2. Although you will find uses of MD5 and SHA-1, which are 
widely spread, and you will also find requirements for using them with existing systems. But don't assume that by using MD5 or Shell 1, you are secure. MD5 can be broken and compromised within less than a second. Um, Rad Studio also uh, ships with one non-cryptographic hash called Bob Jenkins. Hashing has many uses outside of cryptography, and it should be noted that security-based hashing algorithms may be used for non-security purposes as well. So let's take a little look at this. We have, uh, there is a class called T, well, it's not a class, it's actually a record structure, uh, T hash SHA2, uh, and it has a method on it called get hash string. And I can pass in it the, the value that I want to hash, and I also have to choose, uh, like if I want to use SHA256, which is just a variant of the, uh, uh, the SHA2 algorithm based on the number of bytes. Uh, and you'll see the differences here between the Delphi and C++ code. They're very, very similar. Um, and ultimately, we just have to use uh, or include system.hash. Uh, and let's talk a little bit um, about some use cases that you'd use when you use a crypto cryptographic hash. The easiest use case is verifying data such as a file or message has not changed. For years, people have seen hashes on files published to allow the receiver to verify the source of a given file was not changed and transmit. A few examples uh, that are also available are uh, storing of passwords, message authentication, and, and digital signatures. Let's uh, dive into uh, uh, the way we store password. History has shown that it's nearly impossible to keep intruders out of your system. So it's not a question of when will they get in. It's, or it's not a question of if they'll get in. It's a question of when. So the first off, don't ever store your passwords in clear text. If you hash the password when it's entered and store it, then you can compare the hash of uh, the password entered by the user, and then you don't need to know the password. The system emails, when a system that I'm using emails me a password. When I press the I forgot button, it tells me they don't care uh, about security of me or their customers. They don't care, uh, and it's time for me to close my account with them and make sure that I don't use that password ever again because it is common value knowledge. Uh, there are common passwords out there that are all known to those who might hack your systems. So if a common password and uh, is used and it's given a when we hash it, it's given the same hash and run against the list of passwords you have, you will see the results. So you could say, hey, the password of let me in, uh, something simple that I know that I've, I've seen, or ASDF1234, common password, there's a whole bunch of these, right? Um, the common passwords, um, when I hash that, I can have a pre-built dictionary uh, that can list all of the, the known passwords, and then I'm easily uh, able to uh, prevent, or not prevent, figure out people's passwords uh, because of that, because I'm just comparing the hashes and I know the source data. Uh, well, to prevent that and to make it more difficult, we introduce something called a salt. Uh, the first salt that we have, a salt is a random piece of data that's combined with your input data. Uh, typically it's appended, but there's no reason why it can't be someplace else in the data. Uh, that first salt is stored with the password itself. And so you take that salt, and uh, this prevents uh, the dictionary attack from working against all your passwords instantly. However, they can still dictionary attack one at a time. It's just slower. So all we've done is slow them down, and uh, that's, actually an important thing because the time that you get hacked, the time that it's made public, and the time that we notify users, every minute counts because there are people going after your customers instantly. So this is what you need to do is, uh, this helps reduce uh, uh, your exposure. The next one is, a uh, uh, because of that, we introduce a second salt. And the salt is in a global value that's stored separately from the password. This value um, is combined with the other passwords 
and the previous salt. And now if we if someone is able to get your password file and they're able to get both salts, they're still effective at getting um, versing a given password, but they still need one that hopefully you've stored separately and that they so you might have your passwords in a user table and a database and the global hash and a config file and they might get the one through a SQL ejection hack and not have any ability to get the config file and so this will help uh, reduce your exposure and so it's important to do that so both dictionary attacks and rainbow table attacks are common with password files and this happens every single day let's talk a little bit about uh, another way of using hashes which is uh, hash based message authentication code or an HMAC a MAC or message authentication code is a piece of information that's used to authenticate a message HMAC is basically a hashed version of that it provides data integrity to a given message has not changed it also pri provides authenticity the message is from a source that knows the shared key HMAC, however, does not encrypt the message, so that data needs to be secured by another mechanism uh, if, with encryption before, uh, so before signing with, say, an HMAC algorithm. Uh, both sides of the system have a shared key, uh, and it's commonly used in REST services, but I need to point out that if you, uh, say, use an HMAC in your mobile application, you've probably given everybody that key. Uh, so it's uh, just something to think about, um, uh, whether you know it or not. Hey, I've been using this, but anybody can now use that uh, key. But it's um, getting an HMAC in RAD Studio, however, is very simple. And it is useful, and it is a very useful algorithm for many things. Uh, HMAC is supported by um, uh, um, uh, with MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-2. Note that the crypto analysis on MD5 and SHA-1 are okay and don't suffer from the same problems that you have when you implement them with just a typical hash. Uh, because of the way that an HMAC works, there's enough uh, uh, additional um, factors at play that help keep those secure. However, if you're implementing a new system, I would still recommend using SHA-2. So as you can see here, I can call just uh, thash md5, get hmac, or get hmac as bytes, and I could do this quite quickly with uh, uh, all the algorithms, and it's very easy to do. Symmetric um, uh, key cryptography systems depend on a shared key. Any party that knows the key can decrypt the data uh, by this key. The process starts with plain text. Most algorithms take the key, an initialization vector, or sometimes called an IV, or a one ons uh, although not all of them use an IV. Together these are used uh, during the encryption process to produce uh, the resulting ciphertext. The key and the IV both need to be used again to decrypt the data. Um, so uh, note that the shared key is uh, considered secret and the initialization vector is commonly not uh, uh, a shared secret uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about a, what's called a block cipher so a block cipher is we have uh, the, the the algorithm is built and designed to work with a fixed amount uh, of data so with the des algorithm the block size is 64 bits and if you'll notice the key size that is also there, this is the key that we're using to encrypt, is 56 bits. Um, DES is very insecure and shouldn't be used. However, there is a variant of DES, triple DES, uh, that still has that 64 uh, bit size, but introduces key sizes of 56, an additional 112 and 168. Uh, if you're needing to use uh, a triple DES, uh, the bigger the key size, the better. There's also another algorithm out there. There's lots of these. There's tons of different block ciphers. Uh, but AES, or uh, Rijendel, uh, I hope I can spell, say that right. I've never known exactly how to pronounce it. Rijendel 
uh, has a um, block size of 128 bits uh, and has a key size of 128, 192, or 256 bits. And this is bits. So we have a problem. Uh, we have lots of data that we need to encrypt that's much larger than this. And so we have lots of different ways. You know, the initial thought was, hey, let's just, um, so we need to deal with that. So what we have is we have something called mode and padding. Mode is the method or to handling these multiple blocks of data. Another word that's commonly used is chaining um, for this. And basically it allows us to combine all of those blocks together into a single encrypted result. Uh, padding deals with the fact that uh, we work with fixed uh, block size and you're not going to have data that's going to fit that block size all the time. So it deals with the last bits of data that don't fit in the block. And there are several different methods of padding uh, that uh, are out there. So let's talk a little bit about the electronic code book or ECB. This is the uh, poor man's way of uh, dealing with this. Hey, we'll just keep repeating the same algorithm over and over and over again. So we take our given plain text in, we give it the key, we run it through the encryption, and we come back with the cipher text. And so we've, you know, it, but we're on a very small bit of data. So, you know, 64 bit. Uh, uh, we're not talking bytes, we're talking bits. And so uh, what happens here is patterns start to happen. So this uh, ECB, if you ever find that you're using ECB, you're totally insecure. Well, let me explain. Let's watch what happens. With this uh, original image on the left, I found this on Wikipedia, and I just give a wonderful source here because it, it just um, demonstrates so well what ECB does. Because of the nature of it, when they did the encryption on the original image, you'll see that there's a pattern. All the white space all has the same value. And because of that, you can see what's the white space. As each color changes, you can see the color changes. So with ECB mode, I can kind of still see the image. There is data still to be found using ECB. Obviously not secure. Most every other mode out there gives you a um, far more uh, random image. And that's the kind of thing that you'd like to see with your data. So this is really uh, quite telling on ECB. So we're going to talk a little bit about another method. And this is cipher block changing. This is probably the most common uh, method uh, that's out there, although there's many. And uh, this is kind of, it's not a, a standard, but it's almost a de facto standard. It's used a lot. Uh, you take the, the plain text. And you give this initial initialization vector that we have. And then initialization vector is XORed on the first bit of data. So your data is XORed with that. Uh, then it's run through the algorithm, all right, uh, that produces uh, the ciphertext. And the result of that ciphertext is then XORed with your uh, um, new plain text. So they're chained together. So you have to have done the first bit of encryption before you can do the second bit. So with the first one, you might have had, uh, with electronic code book, you can do some things like parallelization, but it's at a very big cost. Whereas in CBC, uh, there's no way to do parallelization of this algorithm. Although there are chaining or uh, modes of operation that are much more friendly to parallelization, you need a library that can take uh, benefit of that. Um, and so that is um, uh, up to you to decide. And, and, and even if it can use uh, parallelization, most of the ones I've found still don't use that. On the other hand, decryption can still be uh, um, uh, used in some of these very easily to be uh, uh, parallelized because I can decrypt a given block and then deal with the XORs and that later. It, it all depends on the type of operation, and that's something you should be looking at. So let's look at this. ECB, uh, that's one called electronic code block. There's no external input for each block, so it demonstrates that pattern, and it's insecure. Uh, code block chaining, or C, 
BC. That's the one we were just looking at. Ha takes the prior plain text and XORs it on the result and then continues to change uh, that through. Cipher um, feedback takes the prior plain text and XORs it on the input. Uh, uh, output feedback uh, uses the cipher text as an XOR value. Uh, counter uh, this is one that's uh, more friendly to parallelization, has an incrementing counter for each one that's uh, also involved in that. And then uh, X, E, X, and there's lots of variants of all of these, including specifically this one, is an XOR encrypt XOR, which basically takes a unique value and XORs uh, each uh, uh, block. Uh, Maybe this is way over what you need to deal with, but the thing I need to point out is just don't use ECB. <laughs> All right, you're going to probably be fine with most of the others, uh, but reading through each of them is good. And the other reason is I get a lot of people, I've read, you know, lots of uh, uh, questions about uh, encryption over the years from people and say, hey, I'm using Library X and I can't decrypt with Library Y. And, and they must be uh, working differently. Well, there's lots of reasons why. Uh, one, uh, your key might not be in the same encoding. You need to make sure that your key is in the same encoding when you're starting. Number two is your initialization vector needs to be the same. And that's not always the case. Um, and then you also have to have the same block mode. And so these are critical to be able to encrypt uh, from library A to library Y. And uh, it's not always thought of very well uh, in that respect. Padding uh, was the other thing. Padding takes uh, data that's too small to fill a block. Uh, many methods for padding. We have bit padding, byte padding. There's some standards out there. Uh, one thing is, is there's uh, this padding oracle attack. So uh, what happened with this attack is it was really in the um, SSL and SSL 3.0 actually all the versions, but uh, what this allows it to do during the negotiation process is this uh, figures out if a given block is padded correctly. Well, basically you could give it data and say, I've I padded this data correctly, and it could figure out the padding. And because of it, this Oracle definition is basically, it says, hey, I, I could see, I could infer bits of information about how you're encrypting because of it. So we need to be careful about what information we share. And um, although the padding oracle attack uh, was specific to the padding in this case, it could uh, be around anything. So the key has to be sensitive, obviously. Then we have initialization vector. And this is kind of arbitrarily the opposite of what we had uh, with that. Initialization vector can be known and quite often is known to the end. It's a pseudo random value. It's critical to a streaming cipher uh, implementation, uh, which is basically um, to implement this correctly. Um, the IV, uh, like I said, can be public knowledge and, and can be sent clear. It just shouldn't be repeated. It needs to be. So when you're dealing with the random value and say you're encrypting something and then you start all over the process, you should not be using the same initialization factor. So if you're encrypting files, you can start the IV in the actual file, typically right before the encrypted data. Um, and this is a common practice among many libraries. Um, uh, but let's point out Wi-Fi. If you're familiar with it, there's the WEP protocol. And um, it used RC4, which is a streaming um, uh, a cipher. Uh, it had no, well, uh, um, no external IV or initialization vector. The web key was concatenated with the IV, and since the IV was not sufficiently random, a birthday attack, which basically, if you walk into a room and ask how many, the odds of guessing somebody's birthday are fairly high. Um, um, it, it's there's a principle there that it, it, the, the, how it got that name, um, but you can start guessing. Uh, what the IV was because it wasn't sufficiently random. Uh, and because of that, they were able to determine the web key. So hence the same key should never be used twice in a stream cipher. Programs 
freely available on the internet can hack the web protocol in around three minutes. Uh, I, I uh, a, a few years ago had a, a security um, uh, class uh, that I was taking in, um, and we were required to download and uh, actually perform this hack. And it was quite interesting to learn how to ethically deal with this and how you should avoid this on that. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, passwords and keys. Um, both are the way to your data. So it's important for them not to be dictionary words. It's also important that they not be hash of dictionary words. It needs to contain random data. Otherwise, it's susceptible to brute force attacks where they try every combination of dictionary words. Swapping out letters for numbers and symbols is known to hackers, and they add these to their dictionaries when they attack. They also use combinations of various dictionary words together. Uh, so when they're doing brute force attacks. Um, um, so just a thought, be careful about uh, how you're gonna do this. Another thing is, is um, be aware of where you're storing these uh, passwords and keys. Uh, uh, if they're in a spot that's easy for uh, somebody to get at, then they probably have them. So uh, the next one we're going to deal with here is uh, talk a little bit about which um, algorithms are out there. So um, on the block cipher side, we have uh, Rijendel or AES. Uh, Rijendel has a few additional features that AES doesn't. AES is a fixed block size. There's a couple of different block sizes that are in Rijendel, but overall they're the exact same algorithm. So if you pick AES, you're really using uh, uh, a Rijendel algorithm with a specific block size. And Blowfish is another one. Um, Bruce Schneider is, uh, oh, well, I see Blowfish here twice on my screen, but there's two fish in Blowfish. Uh, and I don't remember which one Bruce Snyder's responsible for, uh, but uh, uh, there's also, uh, that's a common theme out there. RC5 is a block cipher, and then DES, uh, which stands for Data Encryption Standard, and it's no longer the standard. So just an FYI of that. AES is Advanced Encryption Standard for those who there, and, and they got those names because of FIPS, uh, Federal Information Processing Standard. They put out a, uh, a call and a challenge for algorithms and multiple algorithms were picked uh, to be finalist and ultimately they picked the, the, the algorithms they did. Um, there's also a concept of stream ciphers and the stream cipher is a little different. It doesn't need, to, it, it can work with an arbitrary amount of data and uh, can continue uh, um, dealing with the fact that data is always streaming through it and, and it, it, it has some unique benefits of that um, and so the salsa 20 uh, uh, whether or not you realize that you're probably anytime you use the chrome browser to visit google you're using salsa 20. it's because it's built in it's part of uh, uh, one of the uh, standards that's involved with um, there and it's not really a standard it's uh, the way uh, ssl and, and, and thread level uh, tls uh, can can work well really tls it allows them to negotiate what cipher to have. So if both sides have it, this is which one's used. There's also something called Rabbit and RC4. Um, block ciphers are also, um, when they use the chaining and the padding, uh, could be considered stream ciphers in some sort of way. I mean, people consider them that way. Uh, some documentation will differ on that one way or another, but ultimately I, I point that out so that you can uh, be aware of that. Notice these are just examples of the algorithms, and there's many more in each category. Let's um, uh, talk a little bit about um, symmetric uh, or asymmetric or public key cryptography. This is significantly different. It takes in a given plain text, and we go to the encryption process, and it needs an input of a public key. That public key can be known to everybody, hence the name of it. It is public. Then uh, with that encryption process, we end up with a ciphertext. The only way to decrypt the ciphertext was with a private key. This private key um, 
is then used to decrypt. So I can encrypt anything and guarantee that the only person with the private key can decrypt it. And so that's this uh, uh, an incredibly uh, uh, safe way to uh, send data. Uh, and it is used all the time. Anytime you're using uh, uh, HTTPS, uh, it uses what's called a Diffie-Hellman uh, protocol, which is basically a public key uh, protocol that allows us to um, uh, take this uh, a given public, it, the public key you have is this, uh, the certificate that you're uh, issued. You can use, well, that also contains the private key, but then there's a public that's that's sent with that. So as soon as you start to communicate, they send you the public key and then you encrypt the data that you want and you send back and they can only, they're the only ones that can decrypt it. And this is kind of a negotiation that happens at the start of an HTTP session. So why would we use a public key versus the other? Well, symmetric keys in uh, comparison to public keys, well, the symmetric key has less computational or CPU cost. Public key is far more uh, intense on the processor. It requires a higher computational cost, uh, so it's slower. Um, however, um, symmetric keys, uh, they don't scale very well. If I have to share keys multiple places, my risk of exposure is much higher. Uh, uh, however, public key uh, is very scalable. Uh, it runs the backbone of uh, the web exchanges today that are secure. Um, with symmetric key, you can encrypt or decrypt. All right, and so with that same key. So once you lose the key, all the data that encrypted that with that key is 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 basically a plain text or, or available as plain text. But with public key, as long as I can keep the pi private key truly private and, and not uh, shared, it's the only end that can decrypt. Um, so why would I use one or the other? Well, in public key, it's so expensive, and I mean really expensive, uh, to encrypt. Let's take PGP, for example. PGP is uh, uh, a way of encrypting messages that only a sender or a given set of senders can, uh, or not senders, receivers can decrypt uh, message. So I could say I'm going to send this message to three different people, and they all have given me their public key. Well, what PGP does is internally it encrypts using their public key a symmetric key. So it's actually encrypting the faster version key so it generates a random bit of data and for the key and then stores that under public so basically the public key is used to exchange symmetric keys and I know that I probably really louse that up in some ways but open um, with your um, SSL it's doing the same thing so once uh, you uh, well not SSL I, I gotta stop doing that at TLS or basically your secure um, web session, the first thing it does is uses the public key to exchange a symmetric key. And once both sides know the symmetric key, they're able to communicate safely, and that key that was symmetric was generated randomly at the first. So one thing about it is Delphi and uh, and C++ Builder do not ship with any encryption algorithms. They just don't. Um, and it's kind of a frustration of mine um, because you're forced to deal with lots of them, different algorithms out there, and they all have their different uh, nuances and, and, and flavors. And we've used, uh, at the place I work, multiple variants of each of these uh, over the years. So uh, Lockbox, it's available in the Get It Package Manager. Uh, there's two different versions. There's a lockbox version two and a lockbox version three, uh, and that's kind of gives you an idea. If it, well, one's based on the original Turbo Power Code, version three is a complete rewrite, but just took the name. So they're actually two different code bases, and they're both getting ma uh, maintained independently. Hence, 
some of my confusion. TForge is a, a, a very uh, a nice library. It has lots of different uh, options in there. Uh, Tori has a huge list of options right here on this web page. Uh, but one thing about Tori is a lot of those are out of date. So if, say there's a vulnerability found in an algorithm A and it needs to be patched in some way, there's nobody maintaining some of those. So that's important. Um, and because of that, uh, you might want to look at something like uh, Secure Black Box. Uh, and Secure Black Box is the only commercial product that's out there that I have seen for uh, Delphi encryption libraries. Um, and quite often, uh, it, it's in, it's been licensed to lots of third parties that implement encryption. Um, so it's in certain third party code all the time. Um, C++, uh, crypto++, plus plus, uh, and open SSL. Uh, one thing I should point out here is, is uh, you are using the Kling compiler. Uh, the Kling compiler does support a new set of instructions for AES. Uh, the processors nowadays have uh, four or five instructions that are uh, assembly instructions that basically um, uh, allow AES to be performed at the hardware level much easier and much faster. And that's really quite awesome, but Crypto++ and OpenSSL have been compiled quite often to use those. And because of that, that's, that's, that is nice. Also, platform APIs tend to be faster as well because they are dedicated and know and how to manage the various uh, platform. These can also be used by Delphi as well, but you're required to convert the headers whereas I list them here under the C++ uh, because uh, the APIs are, are easily consumable on each of the platforms. Um, some additional information that you might have are there's tons of great uh, articles on Wikipedia. It's a really, um, anytime you get lost here, you can get farther in depth with uh, encryption and cryptography in Wikipedia than you probably want to. Uh, um, so, uh, it'll get you um, uh, a good start. Uh, however, one thing that uh, I always like to be aware of is this new and common ways that uh, systems are being hacked. And the Open Web Application Security Project, I found up is a very nice uh, and great resource uh, for that. It talks a little about the various different types of attacks and how you can mitigate those and what are the things that are there. And I've seen, although it has web in its name, I have seen these attacks on desktop and mobile applications. So uh, granted, certain things like cross-site scripting are truly um, uh, web-based. There are other attacks such as SQL injection or command injection uh, that I've seen used on all uh, types of applications. And keep in mind that um, as soon as you start building REST or EMS type services, you have a web portion of your application. Uh, whether or not you would consider that, if I've got a middle tier that's uh, REST-based, that REST-based is a web app. Uh, it might not have a user interface, but it's still got the exploitable points as before. If you want to get into far more details about cryptography and how each thing really works, there's a six to eight week course on it, and it's free. And Stanford has it out there, and it's a really awesome course. Uh, it takes some time uh, to go through it. Uh, there's also several other um, uh, uh, free cryptography courses that are out there on the internet as well. I've also listed all of the um, uh, uh, URLs that I had for the various um, uh, uh, libraries that we I mentioned throughout the session. I'd like to uh, thank you all for listening to my presentation. And for those listening live during Code Rage, please submit your questions now, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Great to have you with Robert. Uh, great uh, introduction. Intr great introduction. I can't wait for the, the follow-on where you drill down into uh, EMS data snap app tethering REST web services and raw indie sockets at 1 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Um, let's see, Ken said, good knowledge. Thank you very much. Um, mobile is a whole nother world, right? Mobile, because now the, 
the servers aren't locked up in in the uh, you know in some secure building or semi-secure building. Who knows? Uh, these devices go all over the place, right? Uh, Correct. And there's all sorts of craziness with you know APKs that are side loaded and who knows what's going on and are apps in stores secure and safe? Uh, do you have any sort of general advice to developers about how to um, at least let their users know that what they're doing is safe and secure? Um, no, I've never thought of how to actually let the users know. I always think of it from the point of view of uh, what can I do uh, just to make uh, the things safer. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind uh, is uh, basic, some of the things that I had in there that, that are basics. Um, you know, uh, cryptography is only as good as the encryption key that you're using. So uh, I have seen numerous times where people will hard code a key into their application and consider it secure. And that is the farthest from the truth. So the uh, management of keys and where you store them and, and communicating those, uh, that's why things like SSL were developed, so you initially use a public key and uh, then uh, can move and use that, uh, uh, get a, um, a symmetric key safely. Uh, that, so when you're building, uh, say, a mobile application, you want to uh, uh, avoid storing those keys with your app because as soon as you have that key with your application guaranteed, uh, it's not. Uh, it's as if it's plain text, and so uh, and that's a, a common thing I've seen. Uh, it's uh, easy to do, and uh, we all think, "Hey, we're encrypted," but uh, and those are very exploitable attacks. And uh, in today's world, it it happens all the time. Yeah, one of the things I don't know. If, are we getting an echo? Maybe not. It should be okay. Yeah, well, initially I had one. Oh, okay, good. Maybe it's gone now. I hope. Um, I, you know, I'd visited customers and I caution developers when they're using our products. Um, for example, doing database connectivity when you're doing testing live at design time, you put your username and password on the properties maybe versus loading from through some other mechanism. Um, and then I point to them and say, if you ever deploy this app, you know your username and password is in the form file, which is streamed in. in put link to the executable and you can do string search to the executable and, and find out. And they say, no, we never do that. We always clear them out and went to visit one customer and they said, what are one of your apps and to one of the developers and they did string search and there it was right, right in an, an executable. So there's those, I mean, just things to think about and um, yes, beyond, absolutely. you know, in the way we develop apps in C++ Builder and things you might do separate from all the technology. Have you ever gone to some of the uh, white hat, black hat conferences? Have you ever gone to DEF CON in, uh, DEF, in, uh, in, what is it, in Las Vegas, I guess? No, but I work with people who do. Okay, there you go. Uh, That's why I say I would not consider myself a security expert. I know people who are. And I know there's, a, there's conferences like that and elsewhere. I think one of the cool things I've been seeing when I visit college universities now is, is a lot of the universities in computer science, software engineering, they have classes and, and even majors now in, in cybersecurity and, and cryptography and, and secure computing, and they usually have white hat clubs, you know, for, the, for developers to tool and play around and set up labs and look for intrusions. They're, they're being funded by companies like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, some of these companies that are involved in that whole cybersecurity world. So I think that's great that a generation of, of uh, college uh, graduates are coming out with all that stuff, but maybe they'll enter the dark side. I'm not sure. I, you know, I graduated just two years ago. I went back and decided to do it, and uh, that's the class I took on, on security, and we did do just this. Yep, there's a whole major now and, and, and specialty uh, on a lot of campuses because cybersecurity is such a huge thing. Um, I just wanted to mention, you know, the reason uh, we don't ship strong encryption technology in our dev tools is that 
in the U.S. because we're a U.S. company, we ha we'd have to apply for all these export licenses and where's this software going? And we don't really know. I mean, we know who it's who the tools are going to, but we don't know the stuff they're building and where it might go. We do that. We do AES uh, 256 in, in Interbase. In that case, that's a deployment technology, right? It's a deploy. So there, uh, we've we've applied for the export and how to you know how to alert our customers that are doing deployment of apps that they have to go through a process. Um, but that's one of those reasons. Although you could call the APIs like Microsoft Crypto API or some other APIs and then do your own world of putting the runtime libraries and other things in, in there when you're shipping your applications versus us, including things in our, in our runtime libraries that you would link in and, and go. So um, let's see. I was writing a few notes. Some I'm going to wait for the next session because they have to do with some things other than uh, – I think it's, and you'll probably talk about this, we now in 10 Seattle, we're using the platform native uh, HTTP libraries uh, for EMS Cloud and DataSnap. Maybe you'll mention that. I, I was attempting to, but it didn't make the presentation. Okay. And that, uh, but if you're still using Indy, there's still dependencies on OpenSSL and other things, uh, unless there's been an update to Indy to map into, the, again, the platform native no. HTTP and so on. Okay. Um, if you have questions out there, put them in. I've been writing on pieces of paper. Let's see. That's the native platforms. Um, if you have old, if you're using older versions of our products, then uh, there's still some open SSL requirements because we built stuff on top of uh, on top of Indy uh, originally. But in 10 Seattle, we take care of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael's just saying hi. Just to point to another nice free crypto library with awesome documentation. I, I've used successfully in the past. Uh, credits go to Peter Goodman, and it's Cryptlib. So I'm going to put it's in two different parts. So I'm going to put a smiley on that one, and then he's the URL is going to show up in the the Q and A log to the uh, library. It's, uh, it's out of looks like out of Auckland, New Zealand, somewhere down there. Oh. Not heard of this one. Okay, so that's there. Also. Um, Boy, and I have to remember how to find the URL. Uh, Daniele Titi, when he was doing blog posts about data snap and encryption, uh, he had a, a, a blog post. Let me see if I can find it. TPI encryption. He collected a whole bunch of links. Uh, let's see in his in his blog. Okay, wall true encryption. So I'm gonna. It's, I'm going to paste. I'm going to paste this URL. It was a it was a compendium of a whole bunch of uh, data snap filters, uh, which are which are also the some of the main same ones you mentioned, like Blowfish and and so on. And and so I'm going to put that in the chat window, uh, if I can figure out how to click plus over there. So there's Daniele Titi's his his blog is called While True Do semicolon, uh, but he's got a link again to a bunch of uh, encryption things with screenshots and other things and that was that's an older blog it goes back to I think to Delphi 2010 uh, time frame and, and win 32 but that's a link that I put in the chat window you know I want to point out one thing with those data snap examples I've seen in the past and that was uh, they would use the same initialization vector over and over again which is the same uh, weak point uh, you start getting patterns in your data because of that, and it becomes exploitable. So uh, when you're dealing with uh, something that has an event hook and to do your encryption and your, and your uh, hooking for, and, and it's kind of a, a pseudo stream that's coming through, you're getting X number of bouts of bytes, and, and you're going to encrypt that, you'll want to make sure that um, uh, the initialization vector is uh, sufficiently random throughout your data. Uh, otherwise, it, it will patterns will appear and uh, it will be exploitable. And so, it's one of those things that people don't typically do, and it's not necessarily knowledgeable when you start looking at the, the sample code, uh, because sample code has, says, "Hey, I've encrypted it," but it's not necessarily secure in that respect. I've also been, read articles in in recent uh, years. I'm I'm still a member of the communications for the ACM, CACM, or just ACM. I'm sorry, reader of that, but I've been a member yeah. of ACM since 1972. I don't know if that means I'm old or not. Um, I used to be the 
the head of our student chapter of ACM at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, but there's been articles that have been showing up in recent times about rethinking computer architectures from the ground up and the top down uh, with security in mind, completely different uh, architectures. I was interested, and I'll have to find that link you talked about. Maybe it's in one of your links about uh, Clang enhancements for hooking into hardware uh, hardware systems because memory just sits there, right? And people could people have figured out ways to to listen for memory or listen for you know electronic signals and all sorts of things. But uh, rethinking how the architecture of the processor itself and the memory work. Yeah, I've read an article very similar to that. Um, also a member of ACM. So, um, um, but uh, uh, I have, I'm not sure um, where the future lies there. Uh, the, the, what, the stuff I was talking about with Clang, uh, however, is uh, motor, most modern processors now support new assembly instructions. And the Clang compiler uses those and most of those open C++ uh, libraries uh, resort to using uh, those instructions directly. So you can uh, uh, get really high speed AES encryption uh, because it's actually implemented not in software but actually uh, on your CPU. Yeah, exactly. And I know there's different companies. Thales comes to mind. IBM uh, has, uh, you know, crypto cards and all sorts of other things. I think if you just look at some of the cybersecurity companies now, they're usually, they're oftentimes not only protecting and helping their customers protect, but they're delivering hardware software solutions as well. Yeah. Okay, and then, uh, oh, so bio, did you, I, I had to step out for a moment and I'll go back and look. Did you talk about bio, biomedical or biosecurity in the sense of, I think the Apple Watch or somebody was saying, well, you have to have not only the fingerprint, but it's got to be uh, pulsing blood to know that the, there's a human and that people's blood rates and heart rates can be minutely different uh, versus using retina and hand and other things. Uh, there are certain things there. So I did not talk about that, but uh, I used to do um, firmware development, um, and we had fingerprint readers, and it was all tied with uh, a Delphi system. Uh, and it was used, uh, uh, but people would come in and, 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 and have to put their fingerprint on, and we were able to fake out those ring during our testing readers with just tape, basically taking a taped fingerprint of somebody else's and putting it on. I could always uh, fake that out. So the sensitivity and the nature of the sensors, you, you do have to look at uh, lots of ways to um, uh, uh, Every system you build, there's going to be somebody who finds the way to game it. And so that's what you're always looking at. It, it happens in business. Uh, forget technology. You have a new management process, and they say, we want our estimates in X number of ways. Uh, and you craft your game to make those estimates work that way. Then the process changes, so you craft your game to make it. Well, that's the same thing that uh, is always happening with people who use your software. They are saying, hey, how am I going to use this software in a way it works for me? And they'll be exploiting it uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, uh, at, and so an example is like, yeah, when you're talking about a fingerprint reader, uh, somebody's going to say, hey, I'm going to uh, clock in my buddy since it was a time clock we were developing by using uh, a taped copy of their fingerprint. And so, uh, you know, we had to deal with uh, various issues with that. Uh, that uh, but um, it, it's a common problem. 